uh, webinar. Uh, and as you can see on this slide here, these are the presenters. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, here is the agenda for this morning, uh, afternoon. Uh, first of all, uh, our team members are gonna talk about the, the, the project and you can see the different topics there. Then we're gonna have a, a break, if you will, for Q and A and please uh, put your questions into the chat box and then a, ver a team member will respond to it. And then we're going to have a, an introduction to the uh, Cape Community of Practice, uh, uh, which will be then be followed by another time for questions and answers. Next slide, please. So here uh, are the people who will be presenting. I think you will likely know some of them um, and you can see their names and pictures there. Uh, next slide, please. We also have two people who are working behind the scenes, Kate and Nicole, thank you to everyone for their contributions. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm turning over to Amanda. Thanks, Norman. Uh, hi, I'm Amanda Farrell Lowe. Uh, I am the communications officer here at CSER. And I just wanted to do some quick housekeeping before we get started um, and starting with the territorial acknowledgement. So the yellow circle is where UVic stands. It's the uh, Lekwungen peoples whose traditional territory the university stands. And I also want to acknowledge the Songhees, Esquimalt and Wasanic people whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. And I always feel like this is a particularly important thing to acknowledge when we're talking about alcohol and other drug policies, which have disproportionately impacted Indigenous people here in Canada. And I know we have folks tuning in from all over. So if you'd like to let us know uh, the territory that you're calling in from in the chat box, that would be great. Next slide, please. Uh, so just some quick housekeeping. Uh, we're going, as Norman mentioned, we're going to have two parts to this one and a half hour presentation. Uh, please use the chat function for questions. Uh, if you'd really like to ask a question uh, by speaking, uh, when it comes to the Q&A portion, put up your hand and we can unmute you. Uh, we do have live transcription, uh, just the stop closed captioning that Zoom provides. You can turn it on on the bottom in your meeting toolbar if you'd like to have that. Uh, we will be circulating presentation materials afterwards, uh, including slide decks, recordings, some summaries, and getting as much translated into French as we can. Um, and if you identify as a person with lived or living experience and you're on the call today, we are offering honorariums. So if you can email us at that email address there, capecopcord at ubic.ca, uh, we can get that sorted. And any further questions that come up today or something that you think of that didn't get answered, uh, you can drop us a note uh, or there, the question may be answered on our website, which I'll be giving a little tour of later. Next slide, please. So I know we have some French speaking folks uh, tuning in today. I will not try to read this out loud because my French is terrible, but I just want to say bonjour and merci for attending today. And we will have some resources in French as mentioned. And with that, I will turn it back over to Norman. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about why alcohol policy is important. Next slide, please. So here you see uh, three bar graphs, three, three bars. The on the left is opioid deaths in a year in Canada. The middle one is COVID-19 deaths. And the far, one on the far right is alcohol deaths. The first two are rightly considered to be ep epidemics or crises, but how come alcohol is not considered to be a crisis or an epidemic? Next slide. There are at least four main approaches to preventing or reducing harm from alcohol. One is clinical interventions. Another one is education and information. Then there's cultural change and finally implementing alcohol policies. Next slide, please. So with regard to clinical interventions, they may be effective, but not all of them are. They're often quite costly, and typically they do not focus on the occasional high-risk drinkers. 
uh, but the occasional high-risk drinkers is a very important part, sector of the population because there are so many of them and many more occasional high-risk drinkers than there are people who depended on alcohol. They also do not address how alcohol promotion or, drinking, or the drinking culture at the population level. Next slide, please. Education information are often of questionable effectiveness in changing behavior. Uh, many of you may know about the, about the numerous school-based educational programs, and only a minority of them have been shown to change behavior. They are very costly if, the, if, if they have any chance of competing with alcohol marketing or advertising. And they are potentially useful as a supplementary strategy, but the alcohol industry often presents it as the main approach to prevention. Next slide, please. So here are two examples of information on alcohol. On the left, you see, Please drink responsibly. And this is the one that's often used by the alcohol industry. And on the light, on the right, pardon me, you see the warning labels that were used in the very famous Yukon experiment uh, that was conducted a few years ago. And you can guess which one the alcohol industry prefers, the one on the left. Next slide, please. With regard to cultural change, there's really no clear roadmap how to do this. And it may take a generation or more. However, Strong alcohol policies can contribute to cultural change. Next slide, please. Alcohol policies have been shown to reduce high risk drinking and harm from alcohol. This, this research goes back at least 100 years. They are shown to be effective and typically of low cost. They are relevant to all sectors of the population and drinking behaviors. They do not victimize specific persons or sectors and they are supported by effective clinical programs and information campaigns. Next slide, please. So what is CAPE? It is a com comparative point in, point in time review of alcohol policies in Canada use a, using a health surveillance approach. We systematically assess the degree of implementation of a series of... <laughs> evidence-based uh, evidence -based policies of, across governments. We all, the first review, was, which was conducted in 2011 and 2013, looked at the 10 provinces, and the second review looked at the 10 provinces, the three territories, and the federal government. Next slide, please. Why do we conduct the CAPE project? 80% of Canadians drink at least one alcohol drink in the past year. So alcohol is the, the most popular drug in Canada. 30 to 40% of drinkers, uh, 15 years and older, drink uh, above the lowest drinking guidelines. In 2017, uh, there were 18,000 deaths from alcohol, 115 years of productive life years lost, and 105,000 hospital admissions. The net cost of alcohol exceeded the revenues as well. Next slide, please. What is the basis of the CAPE project? On the left, you can see the, the WHO and PAHO strategies reducing harms from alcohol, and they've highlighted four main high impact interventions. And on the middle, you can see the, the names of, of various publications, reviews, and comparative reviews that we use to inform our project in different stages. And on the, on the right, you can see the MAD Canada Impaired Driving Report Cards. In 2003, for example, MAD Canada assessed the drinking and driving measures used in the provinces and territories and assessed them in terms of their potential impact or real impact. Next slide. So finally, here are the publications and reports uh, from the CAPE-1 project, which was conducted in 2011, 2013. And there were four peer-reviewed publications listed here and also a number of reports. And all of these can be found on the website as shown in the bottom of this slide. And now I'm turning it over to Ashley. Great, thank you, Norman. Great. I am Ashley Welloffer, and I'm a research method specialist on the CAPE team at CAMH. 
As you've heard, alcohol policy is an important public health tool and there's a strong basis for conducting CAPE. So next I wanna outline exactly what CAPE has to offer and then I'll go into some details of the methodology. Next slide, please. Oh, no, sorry, that slide. Yeah, thanks, Kate. As many of you already know, CAPE summarizes the most up-to-date evidence on effective alcohol policies across 11 policy domains, and we identify the gold standard policies in each of the domains. We then score the provinces, territories, and federal government on the gold standard, sorry, their implementation of these gold standard policies. So what exactly does CAPE have to offer? Well, CAPE takes the most up-to-date evidence-based information on alcohol policies and makes it accessible to policymakers, NGOs, and stakeholders. This information is often scattered across different pieces of legislation, policy documents, et cetera, that are held by various ministries in the provinces, territories, and the federal government. If you've ever tried to track down a specific policy in the Canadian context, you know it can be quite the treasure hunt. So what CAPE does is they we pull all of this information into one place and we pair it with the evidence base that supports it. We also offer a systematic comparison of alcohol policies across jurisdictions and over time. So this allows jurisdictions to see what is happening in other provinces and territories, how other regions are addressing the alcohol issues in their area, and how things are evolving and changing over time. CAPE is also a platform for informing the public of effective alcohol policies. Through our research, we've learned that the more the public understands these policies, the more they generally support them. And now that our community of practice is launching, we see that there are several members of the general public that are indeed interested in alcohol policy. Finally, CAPE is a mechanism for keeping a public health approach to alcohol policy on government agendas. We just heard from Norman moments ago that the harms and costs from alcohol are still quite high. And we hear, we'll hear from Faria uh, about the loosening of restrictions during the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is possibly more important than ever uh, to be looking at and to be keeping this, uh, uh, giving alcohol policy a high profile. Next slide, please. So here's just a little bit about the CAPE process. So as I mentioned, CAPE scores jurisdictions on their implementation of effective alcohol policies. So in the first phase of CAPE, our team is focused on updating and refining the scoring rubric used to score the jurisdictions. So first we conduct a review of the evidence in order to select the domains and the indicators that make up the domains. Once the domains and indicators are selected, we conduct a weighting exercise based on the evidence of effectiveness and scope for each of the policy domains. We do this because not all alcohol policies are created equal. Some policies like pricing, for example, have a greater impact on reducing the harms and costs that Norman was talking about. So these policy domains are given a, a greater weight in our scoring rubric to reflect the evidence of their effectiveness and scope. Then our topic experts on the team determine the scoring within the domains. So each domain is made up of several indicators that get scored. For example, sticking to pricing, we look at minimum prices, general pricing measures, taxation and markups as the five main indicators in that domain. And um, just to give you an idea, CAPE 2 looked at 250 policy indicators across the 11 domains. So there's several indicators that make up the policy domains. And finally, we send the rubric out to peer review to a team of international alcohol policy experts and their feedback is incorporated into the final scoring rubric. And I want to mention at this point in the process, once we know exactly what we're assessing, we reach out to the jurisdictions to identify key contacts across the relevant ministries and departments to help us identify and validate our policy data. Uh, next slide, please, Kate. So here's a peek at the 11 policy domains used in both the provincial territorial and the federal assessments for CAPE 2. Uh, and I'll just note that liquor law enforcement was only examined uh, at the provincial territorial level. As was the case between CAPE 1 and 2, for CAPE 3, there's not going to be significant sort of groundbreaking changes to the policy domains. For the most part, changes in CAPE 3 will be reflected in the indicator and the weighting, um, just to reflect the emerging evidence that we are reviewing. Next slide, please, Kate. 
Okay, so going back to our methods, the second phase of CAPE involves collecting the data and applying the scoring rubric that we have um, updated. The data is collected across a range of sources, including legislation, regulations, um, policy documents, codes, guidelines. We also rely on government news releases and annual reports. And of course, our very important key contacts in each of the jurisdictions who are sometimes needed to identify policy information that's not available in the public domain. Once the data sets are completed, we reach out to the data validators and we have them check the complete data sets relevant to their ministry or department for accuracy and to ensure that they are complete and that we haven't missed anything or um, we're not missing any of the important context to the policy. Then the validated data sets go out to our co-investigative team who then independently score the blinded data using the rubric. Uh, when I say blinded, we remove any reference to which province or jurisdiction um, they're scoring so that they are unaware of the jurisdiction they, that is being scored. And then if there's any discrepancies in scoring, uh, these are brought to the PIs for resolution uh, by Kate and myself. Finally, the scores are tabulated. So the domain scores are the sum of the indicators and the final CAPE provincial, territorial and federal scores are the sum of the weighted domain scores. Next slide, please. And here is a shot of our CAPE 2.0 team. Um, we're working hard at finalizing the scoring rubric. I believe this must have been early on in our meeting because we are all still smiling. Um, and I'm going to turn things over to Tim, who is going to give us a brief recap of the findings of CAPE 2.0. Thank you, Ashley. Yes, good morning, good afternoon. Um, Kate, if you could bring up the next slide. So my job is just to remind people, I think perhaps many of you on this call will have hopefully seen some of these results already. And we'll start with the, the scores that were uh, given across the 11 policy domains along the bottom there for the federal government. And I, I mean, I suppose the bad news is the score wasn't very good with a, a failing grade. We gave school grades as well as percentage scores out of a possible 100. But the good news, you think of all the potential there for improvement. I mean, that we do know that there are effective policies across these different domains to the seven directly effective ones on the left and the ones um, on the four on the right are deemed to be ones that the sort of indirect they provide indirect support to the others by having a, a good control system, um, a, a comprehensive strategy to coordinate activities and policies, monitoring and reporting progress, and supporting health and safety messaging, which really gives the rationale for why we need to think about our individual behaviour and have improved policies. So the areas of good performance here would be, I suppose, monitoring and reporting and screening and brief interventions that support the federal government to those but unfortunately in areas where there's most effectiveness in pricing and taxation was like a 24 percent score um, quite good um, uh, support for impaired driving measures the federal government's introduced stronger legislation there um, anyway skip and we'll now go to the, the the next slide for the provincial and territorial scores now, because this was also kind of low, I think the, the average score was about 44% when it wasn't adjusted and it was lower than we got in the 2013 report for 2011 or 2012 um, performance. So even so, we've, um, this, this shows the average scores across 11 domains for all 13 provinces and territories. And we see if we say 50% is a pass, um, we've got five failures. Ironically, the highest score went to Ontario. I say ironically because since 2017, when these um, scores really were applied, famously, Ontario has introduced um, um, a buck of beer and has been deregulating um, alcohol controls at an extraordinary pace. Um, and it seems we may be seeing um, uh, alcohol sold at gas stations uh, for people to drink on the premises, but while, after filling up their cars and before driving away. Um, so 
there's been some falling back. Um, that would all actually also apply in BC, and we're going to hear actually generally, of course, about how some of the loosening of alcohol policies during COVID has likely driven the whole level of um, effective alcohol policy in Canada downwards. And certainly we've seen the results of that with increasing consumption and likely harms. So um, I won't go further, just to, except just to say that these scores were actually scaled up to look better because rather than um, putting 100% here as being what could be the, the maximum possible that could be attained on all of the indicators, we took as the, the highest standard um, here was just what was the best current practice in Canada anywhere and just see how close on each of these domains, each province um, was able to get with what was the best being done currently by anybody in Canada, as opposed to the best possible that we could envisage. Anyway, um, the next slide uh, just breaks things down a little bit by domain. And we see that liquor law enforcement, monitoring and reporting at the provincial level, not very impressive scores with C minuses, but they, they're doing the best. Unfortunately, we've got uh, six failing grades and they include the important ones of pricing and taxation, physical availability, the control system um, and intermediate. Well, none of these are very good, Hello. but impaired driving countermeasures, um, restrictions on marketing and advertising, this sort of modest um, uh, progress there. Um, the next slide, please. This is slightly more hopeful. This shows the best that was done by any of the 13 jurisdictions anywhere in Canada out of you know, the maximum 100%. So we did actually find perfect scores in somewhere, and I, I won't be able to say whether it was Prince, Ed, Prince Edward Island or Nunavut or wherever it was, and with marketing and advertising controls. And if you look at, uh, on average, if, if everybody in Canada, all jurisdictions did the best that was done by any of their peers in other jurisdictions, Canada would have got an A grade, 87%. So, I mean, that's the good news. This is possible. These are not unrealistic standards that we're applying. Nearly all of them are being implemented somewhere effectively. It's only things if you look at minimum drinking age with a maximum score of 60%. Well, we did have 21 years, which is kind of controversial for many people, of course, as the, as the perfect. And of course, the best we get is 19. But other than that, you know, it's possible. It's, it's already been achieved somewhere. These are practical and effective strategies. Next slide. And we did were able to put a lot of uh, resources in Cape 2 into dissemination. We had a fantastic team led by Amanda Farrell Lowe. Um, here's one example. So as well as the big reports now that we had on the overall um, results, individualized reports, mostly in English and French, um, four pages. Um, summarizing in a very digestible way the overall performance in that jurisdiction. This is one for British Columbia. So there's basic data about per capita consumption and harms from alcohol and economic costs, performance in each of the 11 policy domains, highlighting the most promising practices that should really be retained, then giving very detailed feedback in each policy domain about areas for improvement. Um, and these were, these were I, th I think quite effective and gave useful feedback. Just, just want to say a lot of people think that it's just political, a lack of political will that prevents us getting alcohol policies. One of the learnings I had was it's actually the la often it's the lack of practical information about what to do. It isn't enough to know that in general raising price or decreasing availability is what you need to do, but giving very specific concrete steps to achieve those things. And that's what I think we're able to have done with CAPE. And I, I, I believe it, it helps with future progress. Next slide. And we had some other knowledge products. So the different individual reports, we've got the lovely website, um, the major reports that summarize everything, the media stories, um, infographics that are you know, sort of a one page overview of distilling some of the most essential information. 
Next slide. And peer reviewed publications, um, uh, some which brings has brought attention um, to researchers in other countries about what we're doing and gives some credibility as well um, for the methods that we, we, we were implementing. Um, all of these links to these can be found on the website. Next slide, please. And just some of the outputs uh, we're kind of proud of. There was so much work that went into disseminating this and the pre-launch webinars were pretty well attended. You know, we had like over 400 people attending and perhaps there are many more from each of the links there, one screen. Sometimes there'd be a room full of people there. Uh, in the first three months, our resources were downloaded nearly a thousand times. We had nearly 400 media articles published about the results when it was they were released. We had 30 webinars um, tailor-made for particular provinces and territories by special request. And I think if you add up all the attendees there, there were well over a thousand across all the different webinars. And then of course, we physically sent letters and reports and PDF copies to multiple people who had helped us along the way and key government contacts. So a lot of effort went into this dissemination and I'm sure the same will apply for Cape 3, which we're about to hear more about. I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, um, some of our international friends here. So I'm sure all of us here, regardless of where we are located in the world, um, have experienced and are experiencing policy changes, in particular, the impacts of policy restrictions since the very start of the pandemic, whether it was a transition to working from home, um, not being able to attend the gym, mandatory stay at home orders. In the alcohol realm, however, surprisingly, all the policy changes have not necessarily been stricter policies. In fact, many of the observed changes have been quite the opposite. We've seen loosening of policies, ultimately resulting in the increase in our accessibility to alcohol. Next slide, please. So on the screen here, you may be overwhelmed with several headlines capturing just a few of the major alcohol policy changes since the start of the pandemic across Canada. So some of these uh, headlines may stand out more to you than others, but the key commonality that we can pick up from these headlines is an increase in the accessibility of alcohol, whether it be by reduced uh, wholesale prices for bars and restaurants, being able to purchase alcohol on the BC ferries, or most convenient yet, being able to purchase alcohol for delivery with food right to your doorstep. Unfortunately, these changes actually counter the WHO's recommendations at the beginning of the pandemic, which were to tighten the alcohol regulations in an effort to reduce the alcohol attributable burden of disease during a time when, let's face it, we're all anxious, much of the population is lonely and overwhelmed. Next slide, please. So this is a very high level table categorizing some of the key alcohol policy changes since the start of the pandemic by our CAVE 2.0 domains. So you can see that these policies fell under pricing, physical availability, alcohol control system, and marketing and advertising. And this is, of course, not all inclusive. So from the legend at the very bottom, you will note that the light blue represents policies which were relaxed, the darker blue represents policies which are relaxed but also made permanent, and the red represents when stricter policies were implemented. And as an example, under physical availability of alcohol, you will note that the hours of operation for on-premise venues is red, which indicates that um, the hours were reduced, such as for bars and restaurants, and hours for on-premise venues, um, such as government and private retailers in BC, Ontario, and Quebec uh, were extended, and that's why they're in blue. Next slide, please. So this table just shows some specific examples of policy changes affecting pricing and taxation of alcohol during the pandemic. So we observed reduced wholesale prices and wholesale pricing discounts on alcohol in Ontario, BC, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland and Labrador, with bars and restaurants in BC actually being permitted to purchase beer, wine, and spirits at wholesale prices. Another remarkable policy change we observed, which affects the population's um, ability to access alcohol, was the reduced minimum price of spirits uh, consumed on site in Ontario. And this was done in order to align with the reduced pricing introduced for takeout and deliveries. The Ontario government also froze the basic beer tax rates, which are the taxes prescribed to beer sold in Ontario, that were set to be indexed to inflation um, this March to support beer and craft, 
craft beer brewers. But again, this increases our accessibility to alcohol. Next slide, please. So moving on to policies affecting the physical availability domain in CAPE 2.0, across Canada, we still have store hours re reduced or expanded along with the general lockdown policies. So positive policy change, at least from a public health standpoint, was the reduced hours of operation and on site capacity of people on premise at restaurants and bars across all provinces and territories during the pandemic. In Ontario, for instance, reduced capacity were seen as Ontario government uh, moved through its colored stages, stages of reopening. However, what we did not see as publicized in the media, at least compared to closures of bars and restaurants, were the extension of off-premise store hours, such as those for government and private retailers in BC, Ontario, and Quebec. So while this started as a temporary policy change to accommodate seniors and immunocompromised populations um, by opening liquor store two hours earlier, this policy actually became permanent in BC and Ontario. So even more shocking was the recent news of Alberta permitting its first 7-Eleven branch in Edmonton to begin selling alcohol on site for on-site consumption. And for those of you in Ontario, and as Tim had mentioned, um, who have seen the latest headlines, it seems like Ontario may not be too far behind following in Alberta's footsteps, as Ontario is currently awaiting approval for 61 liquor sale licensees to allow in-store service um, for consumption of beer and wine. So we can just begin to imagine the extent that this will exponentially increase our availability to alcohol. Next slide, please. So while we observe decreases in hours of operation for on-premise alcohol retailers, such as bars and restaurants across all jurisdictions in Canada, this policy change was actually complemented by the introduction of home delivery and takeout of alcohol with the purchase of food in all provinces and territories. So while before, you know, the 40 centimeters of snow in Ontario and the blockage of Highway 401 would deter someone from going out to get their booze, today one can simply press a few buttons on their phone and purchase alcohol for delivery right to their doorstep. So the introduction of home delivery has become permanent. And as of today, in all provinces and territories, with the exception of Northwest Territories and Nova Scotia, where it is a temporary policy, and this has huge implications for our accessibility of alcohol. Next slide, please. So in Ontario, we also observed a relaxation of marketing and advertising of alcohol with increased flexibility given for grocery stores to cross promote beer, cider and wine with non alcohol products. So on the right side here, you can see an image of what cross promotion of alcohol would look like at a grocery store, where you see that the ultra beers are promoted alongside with a family meal, which is quite clever. And on the left, you can see a very eye catching advert for wine. Uh, which promotes 10,000 PC points, as well as a sparkling new, new you in a new year. And this just emphasizes how even um, the advertising and marketing of alcohol since the pe pandemic has begun has really amped up. And now I'll pass it over to Tim to go over Cape 3.0. Well, hi, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. I'm the other Tim, Tim Namey, and I've been, um, I'm from Boston. I've been uh, at Caesar now for about a year and a half. And, um, you know, I've done a lot of work in alcohol policy and, and very interested in the work that CAPE has been, has been doing from afar. And so when I had the opportunity to come here, see that smile, that demonic smile on my face, it was because of CAPE I would, that I was coming to Canada. Next slide, please. What we're gonna talk about today is, um, we, we've had a nice, really nice looking back by Tim, Tim S about CAPE 2.0 and Ashley went through all the methods. But Faria's wonderful presentation um, really highlights all the policy changes during COVID and illustrates that it's not just, quote, what happened to alcohol consumption because of COVID, but it's really a lot of the, this is, can be actually uh, explained potentially through policy changes. So this certainly provides us motivation and you can see both in terms of all the real changes that have happened and the rapidity of a lot of these changes that the, you know, a, a new CAPE 3.0 is, is really urgently needed. The bottom line is in terms of, you know, understanding CAPE 3.0 is that it's going to be very similar to CAPE 2.0. So you don't need to exert a lot of mental energy wondering too much about what's going to change. But um, unlike movies, we like to think that numbered versions of CAPE just keep getting better and better. So that CAPE 3.0, do not be discouraged as you might be for Friday the 13th part three, for example. Next slide. 
Well, we have um, really nice project teams. Um, a lot of the names are familiar, but we're kind of uh, have a number of, uh, of uh, investigators and associates here at CSER. These are work, we're working very closely in collaboration with people at um, CAMH, um, particularly Norman um, co-founded CAPE and, and Ashley is our method specialist who knows, has just encyclopedic knowledge of, of Canadian alcohol policies to name a couple. And then we're also working with uh, alcohol policy experts at several institutions across Canada. Um, you may be familiar with some of these names. Um, Jacob Shelley is an interesting addition. His team in the University of Western Ontario, again, bring additional legal expertise um, that we are going to try to take advantage of. And possibly with him and Robert Solomon to, to think about having new knowledge products that are more have more of a legal orientation. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, Ashley talked about the CAPE 3.0 policies that are included and the rubric. And again, we're going to be doing largely the same sort of general domains of, of um, alcohol policies. But we're in the process now of currently revising the approximately 250 or more indicators that go into those domains um, as we update that CAPE uh, rubric. So, um, so we're working on that now. So some of these involve either adding or improving the measurement of COVID-related policy changes or the changes the policies that have become more prominent under COVID. So those, as Priya pointed out, like include a lot of these um, wonderful new ways to get alcohol, either through home delivery, curbside pickup, or take away <clears throat> alcohol <clears throat> from bars and restaurants, excuse me. We're also buffing up our work around some really hot topics in alcohol policy or areas of alcohol policy in which we have new evidence to sort of um, suggest their uh, effectiveness. These would be areas like minimum pricing and the labeling of alcohol products, which of course is so crucial and touches on the area of alcohol as a carcinogen in terms of uh, the possibility of cancer warning labels, calorie information, which are not mandated on alcoholic beverages, and the number of standard drinks or the size of a standard drink in each container of alcohol. We're also going to try to have our revised rubric do a little bit better of a job of incorporating policy processes in an area of deregulation. And by that, I mean, I think a lot of us have been surprised that there'll be these changes that come down the, the pike. And it seems like we've heard that in many cases, public health is never really consulted and that also industry may be involved. So we're gonna to try to build in um, some attributes to some of our indicators that are going to give um, more points towards processes that encourage public health input and restrict or, or avoid industry influence. Next slide. Um, after that rubric is finalized, again, we'll be collecting the policy data for CAPE 3.0. And um, this will be generally the same processes as used for CAPE 2.0 that Ashley uh, outlined. But if we think of, of the rubric as kind of the backbone of CAPE, then the policy data that goes on top of that is the meat on the rubric's bone. And um, doing this data collection is really, really important, but it's the essence of, of what we're gonna, as a group, like discuss and, 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 and score things on. And this data collection will inv involve a variety of things, including the review of relevant statutes, as well as um, some of the data acquisition and validation being done with key government stakeholders, uh, particularly for like practice related in indicators, you know, indicating that a policy is being put into place and actually implemented. Next slide. So uh, Tim S gave us some, some examples of knowledge products, you know, the four pager, but the bottom line is here where we're, um, we're still in, that's gonna be very much formulated and your input um, will matter a lot. So in terms of what kinds of knowledge products people would find more, most helpful, you're welcome to provide stakeholder feedback uh, at the link in either English or French. There'll be many opportunities. You can do it through the, 
through the listserv. Um, we will probably be doing those federal and provincial and territorial four page summaries that Tim showed in one of his slides. But beyond that, we're looking for, for new ideas. You know, we may do additional summaries that are restricted to certain policy domains like pricing or impaired driving, or even focusing on individual indicators that people may have interest in like home delivery, minimum prices or labeling. Um, we will have things for federal versus provincial and territorial uh, data packages. You know, with all of this data that we collect for people that can take advantage of it, either for research or advocacy, it would be nice to make those available. Um, and then we're gonna, again, have a bunch of webinars, but those topics will really be based on the interest from you. Um, so again, this is a really exciting area. We'll, we'll do some of the old things, but we're, we're very open to introducing new knowledge products. Next slide. Uh, you know, we can't, we can't uh, do this without some funding and support and both CSER and CAMH um, really believe in the importance of this project and have uh, put up staked, you know, money to get it underway. We're also very fortunate to have gotten money from SHRC, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, um, in the form of a connection grant that is funding our community of practice, which you'll be hearing more about. Um, we've also gotten funding from the Public Health Agency of Canada to update our rubric. And we're also getting a lot of help and support from our co-investigators and in their institutions. So we really appreciate all of that. Next slide. Uh, and, and last, certainly not least, is our new communication strategy. And that's what the second phase of this presentation will be about. Um, I just wanted to read the description of our community of practice. Uh, the Cape community of practice aims to establish a national alcohol policy community, which builds and sustains long-term connections, collaborations, and professional development between stakeholders from a variety of government and non-government sectors with a shared goal of promoting healthy public policy. So this is the key thing. It's like we have our rubric and we have our data, but the whole purpose of this is to feed and sustain and inform and stimulate our community of practice. So we love it for people to sign up at the link that's there um, and uh, to rejoindre. And we are independent of industry influencer involvement. So our members must be free of those things. We would love to have more folks compared to last time, which I think we're going to be able to achieve, but we're also going to work consciously to also recruit uh, an even broader representation of people and do a um, try to get a few more government regulators, government finance folks, people representing indigenous organizations and organizations representing those with lived experience and also more francophone uh, individuals. And so I think with that, that's my my last um, slide. So I'm going to turn this back over to Norman and thank you everyone so much. There we go. Uh, hello everyone again, uh, Amanda here. I just wanted to do a brief overview of our community of practice, which we're very excited about. Um, and I'm also going to be doing some quick straw polls as part of this, um, just to get a sense of where we're at in terms of how people feel about for potential format of events and the COP itself and how it'll function, because we really want uh, some feedback from everybody on that. Um, so just keep in mind, these won't be set in stone. They're just uh, to take the temperature right now. So they're uh, non-binding referendums here. Uh, so why start an alcohol community of alcohol policy community of practice? Great question. Uh, I know that uh, the great one of the great things about CAPE was that it put folks at CSER and CAMH and working in alcohol policy on the project uh, in touch with people who were working in this area or interested in it uh, across the country. And one thing that kept coming up was that Work was often siloed. So folks would be, say, working in public health, in alcohol policy in a particular province, and they weren't really necessarily connected with folks doing similar work in other parts of the country, or even within government, uh, folks from 
uh, across different ministries or departments weren't really communicating each other with each other, even though they were working on similar files. So we kind of figured why not start a community of practice, create a space for people across jurisdictions and areas of expertise to collaborate, learn from each other, and hopefully ultimately strengthen alcohol policy and just become more aware of the excellent work that was being done across Canada. So our process of developing the community of practice was pretty iterative. We started out with a very, very descriptive uh, 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 proposal that had, you know, very set dates and events, and we had it all kind of figured out. And then we kind of took a bit of a step back and thought, um, you know, what what would be useful? Uh, do we want to be driving the ship as the researchers or do we want to kind of bring it more back to the community? And uh, so we, we took a step back and really looked at some of the other successful communities of practice that we've seen come out of work here at CSER. Uh, a couple that came to mind were the Canadian Managed Alcohol Program Study Community of Practice, which has been active for several years now and is really great really great space and a slightly newer one, one, which is the Collaborative Community Laboratory on Substance Use and Harm Reduction, the CoLab Study Community of Practice. And they, uh, we've uh, begged, borrowed and stolen uh, various uh, ideas from them and had some great support from them in terms of designing what we think will, uh, will work for an alcohol policy community of practice. So we really were thinking we'd want to have a space for collaboration and learning that's driven by the membership, but supported by the CAPE COP team, which are a lot of the folks on the call today. And we also have a coordinating, coordinating committee, uh, which includes some other folks who are on the call today. So thanks to everyone who's been involved with that. And we also wanted to create a space that was free of industry involvement. Um, so there will be some events that we're envisioning that'll be more public and open to anyone, but we also wanted to create a little bit more of a, a space where we can um, just be free of that influence. And you'll notice when you sign up for the COP, there will be some questions about that. Uh, the sort of the vision that I, the example that I like to give when talking about how we're imagining the community of practice is when I ask my partner, what should we have for dinner? And they say, oh, I don't care. Let's have whatever you want. And that response isn't super helpful for me. So we want to create a supportive environment uh, with the CAPE COP team where we're helping, uh, we're leaving the decision open, but not too, not too open. We want to offer some guidance on, um, on what can be done. Uh, so I just wanted to get, we've had quite a few folks sign up for the COP already, which is awesome. Uh, thank you for the folks who took the time. So we have over 60 members already uh, and a couple of, uh, of gaps. We don't have anyone from Manitoba or Nunavut signed up yet, but I'm hopeful that folks will uh, have such a great time at this presentation. Maybe they'll be intrigued to sign up. But already so far, some pretty great representation from across Canada. And uh, you'll probably be spammed with a COP registration link so many times in this presentation. So please sign up if, uh, if you feel compelled to do so. And uh, in terms of member organizations, we've got, um, we've got a lot of interest from uh, different types of areas. Uh, public health is well represented as it often is uh, which is great. We have always have folks from public health engaged, but uh, it's also really great to see some of these other areas being represented. Um, as uh, Tim Namey mentioned, uh, there was, uh, we really are looking to engage with folks with lived and living experience, peer organizations, and uh, folks uh, involved in retailing and regulation and finance. And we've already seen some of those uh, people register. So that's awesome. Thank you so much. And then we, uh, when during the COP sign up, we also asked a bit about what folks are interested in. So I'm just going to launch a little poll here about some potential future event topics. So if you want to, uh, these are things that came up in, uh, 
as, as potential topics with folks we know we can kind of get the ball rolling with pretty quickly. Um, and we just want to get a sense of what uh, what is of interest. This was a little word cloud that uh, Nicole put together based on the, the write-in responses we got from folks. And uh, as you can see, uh, a lot of interesting and in things like pricing, labeling, marketing, that kind of thing. And uh, what we'll be doing is I'll be taking the results from these little quick polls that I've been doing and uh, kind of using it as a jumping off point for the discussion portion of, uh, of the presentation today. And now I want to give you a little quick tour of some of the resources we've put together for the community of practice and uh, and this uh, just CAPE in general. Um, I'm hoping that you can see the CAPE website now on my screen. <laughs> it's hard to tell. Uh, so the team has been hard at work uh, putting, built, revamping the CAPE website uh, and uh, kind of giving it a bit of a refresh as we prepare to launch CAPE 3. Uh, and one section you'll notice on the website that's new is this community of practice tab. Uh, there's not a lot in here yet because, of course, this is our first official COP event, but this will be where we have things like uh, event recordings, uh, notices of upcoming events, and just some background and information on how to join. Uh, but also uh, something that the team has been putting together is this really awesome uh, repository of alcohol policy resources. Um, Ashley mentioned this in her presentation that it can be a bit of a wild goose chase trying to find some of these resources across the country. And so a lot of the publicly available uh, documents we've put together here including some great resources on other evaluations, uh, stuff on alcohol and cancer, uh, look, all the liquor acts and regulations from across the country here. Um, although there are some gaps as we can see because some jurisdictions do not have liquor acts or regulations. Uh, and then some strategy documents and even some municipal alcohol policy documents because as we know, municipal alcohol policy is also important. So, and then of course, if you want anything related specifically to CAPE and its previous iterations and its upcoming iterations, we'll be putting all that stuff here uh, for CAPE 3.0 and we have all the CAPE 1 and uh, CAPE 2 stuff there as well. Um, so yeah, if you haven't had a chance to check out the CAPE site lately, check it out. There's lots of new stuff there. And of course we are always uh, looking for feedback in terms of what kind of resources would be useful to the community of practice. Oops, okay. So uh, we, we also want to uh, get a little bit of a sense of some of the stuff around format of the events. Uh, so as I mentioned, what we're sort of envisioning right now is a range of events, both just the community of practice and op more open to the public such as this one. Um, and hopefully touching on a range of topics and formats, including more researcher led presentations like we've seen today or more stakeholder led presentations. So bringing it back out to the COP members and being like, okay, do you have something that you wanna share with the rest of the COP? Do you wanna talk about the development of your alcohol strategy or, or other things that have been happening in your jurisdiction? What, what are your lessons learned, that kind of thing. And we're also trying to figure out what the timing would be. We're thinking between one to two months, depending on uh, feedback we get from folks. And then the structure, what would be what would be more useful? Would it be a more presentation uh, heavy uh, format like what we had today, something that's more discussion uh, oriented? And one thing that I kind of would love to see as part of the COP, this is uh, part of my vision for it, is I'd like to have a bit of a takeaway action item at the end, because one thing that uh, has come up a lot when we've talked about the COP and uh, all the other great alcohol events that we see happening is we'll have these great webinars, they'll uh, talk about the latest research and the latest evidence, and then it kind of stops there. It's like, okay, well, what next? What do we do with this evidence? What do, how do we use it or other things that we've learned across the country to really uh, try and strengthen alcohol policy. And so one thing I, my dream for the COP is to have it be a place where we can do that. We can find ways to collaborate across the country to try and just strengthen policies 
using the knowledge, not just from the research, which is, uh, you know, is great, but also from each other. And then my last poll is just a really quick one on, uh, so in terms of things, uh, in addition to the events, which will be a really important part of the COP, we also want to have other materials available. So some of the things that I outlined on the website um, will be that'll uh, will be there. Uh, we want to have as much French translation as we can. We have a translator who's been working really hard to translate uh, various documents. So you'll notice our surveys have been translated already. Uh, we're hoping to get translations of our slide decks. Uh, well, our terms of references in French, that kind of thing. Uh, we, those folks who have already signed up will notice there is a moderated listserv, uh, which is a big part of the COP. Um, it is moderated, so we're hoping it's not going to just be, a, well, it won't be just a bunch of email flying back and forth, but we're envisioning that uh, listserv being a way not only for us to communicate uh, about uh, CAPE and the COP and alcohol policy news, but for folks to collaborate and communicate with each other. Uh, one thing idea that has been floated is this idea of having a password protected site for more sensitive documents. Um, I wouldn't say like put totally confidential materials, but something that you'd uh, maybe be comfortable sharing with other COP members. Uh, that uh, you but wouldn't necessarily want to be on the public facing site. Uh, the uh, managed alcohol program uh, COP uses this quite uh, effectively. Um, so we wanted to float that as a potential idea for folks. Like, for example, I think uh, a few months ago, we were contacted about uh, someone in a jurisdiction who wanted to had to act really quickly to launch a survey on alcohol policy. And like, wouldn't it be great if a survey instrument like that already existed and but uh, and was in this uh, repository that we could access and other people could access if they needed if they needed to. Um, yeah, so I think that that's it for me. I want to leave some time for discussion and questions uh, about the COP because we are really, really excited to be launching it and. Um, and yeah, so thank you everyone for attending and uh, I'll uh, just stop sharing my screen and then maybe uh, we can talk a little bit about it. Um, but I guess before we do that, I just want to uh, quickly go through uh, Kate and Nicole and Freya and everyone else has put together these surveys. Uh, we'll be sharing them in the chat box at the end, but just a reminder, if you have some, um, some time to fill them out, we'd really appreciate it. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and then uh, we can maybe have a little discussion. And, and I personally am really excited uh, to see where this all leads. And um, as, as somebody who's new to CAPE, I, I feel like this community of practice is like the, is really the heart of the matter. Like I'm just excited to learn from people and hopefully we'll all share knowledge. And then the key thing is, just building these networks of relationships, uh, finding other people that can help us sort of find our way along and ultimately hopefully take action around good policies to improve public health and community well-being. So um, I guess I'll just close by saying thank you so much for coming and, and you've got all the links and, and just look forward to, to, to working together um, in any ways that, that, that people are able to. So thanks so much. Yeah, thanks everyone. I'll just uh, pop that uh, COP link in here if I can find it. Um...